My name is Denzel Rodriguez, personal finance geek of the 21st century. And we're going to be discussing a case study. We're going to be looking at some retirement examples here. We're going to be discussing quite a few things. And I'm also really excited to introduce my friend here, Daniel, whom I met at the And Asset Mastermind this year in 2023, hosted by Caleb with Better Wealth. So him and I were sitting right in the front row and we just kind of hit it off, started talking a lot about different things. We had multiple phone calls afterwards and there was just a lot of unique strategies that he was doing, that I've been doing, that I've been teaching you guys on my channel, my clients for the last few years. So he's very familiar with the velocity of money, very familiar with the infinite banking concept, but his specialty is primarily in um, retirement income. He's a retirement specialist, right? Or expert, I should say. And you've been doing this for many, many years. So without stealing all of your thunder, I want to give you the floor, Daniel, to just. Are you in this? and anything else you'd like to share. Absolutely. Denzel, thanks so much for having me and that introduction was great. Uh, I wanna start by just saying thank you to everything, uh, you know, to you and everything you're doing. I really enjoyed getting to know your content after we met and, and seeing how you're really dedicated to serving people and who you're serving and who you really are. I, I'm very grateful to know you and uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, as we talked about, we have a lot of similarities in philosophy and how we try to help people. And uh, the work that you're doing, I think I shared with you in one of those calls, I've never watched a 58 minute uh, financial YouTube video <laughs> once. Uh, so to be able to watch your breakdown and your case studies has been yeah. uh, very insightful for me as well. So that one of the ways I think we're so aligned is my personal mission is to help people realize their purpose in retirement. And so for the last 10 years, I've helped people to set up their retirement and then I take care of people in retirement as well. And what that really means is, you know, there's a, a behavioral, an emotional, a mental aspect to the numbers. It's not just about setting up retirement income. It's helping people to give themselves permission and confidence to spend appropriately uh, and to keep that abundance mindset in retirement. And so our company specializes in just setting up the right process to really align with each individual to help them maximize fulfillment in retirement. That's what we do. And so when we started talking, I started seeing all the innovation and how you've really taken two incredible worlds and put them together to serve people. Um, and being somebody who shares that mindset of that philosophy, I knew I had to get to know you and, and we could collaborate because uh, I think we are totally aligned with a lot of these tools that we're using. And so that's really my background and my mission um, and, and what we've been doing. And so, you know, I, I work with entrepreneurs, I work with, you know, individuals, I work with uh, churches, and we really focus on those key components to enjoying retirement. Enjoying retirement, discovering your purpose while in yeah. retirement, because sometimes that may that may pivot after working all your years to now yeah. being in a position where you're no longer working at that career that you spent the last 30, 40 years in. Your yeah. purpose may pivot, shift quite a bit, and Absolutely. so you help people on the, on the emotional side, the the psychological side of just and then how the money uh, relates to that so we can achieve more and more goals. So I really like that. There was a paradigm shift or, or something that came to my awareness that I really had no idea about that you mentioned on one of our phone calls, which was retirement is a woman's issue, right? And when you said that, I'm like, like it, it, I had to take a, a few steps back. I was like, wow, that's interesting. But, yeah. it, but I immediately, it immediately made sense because of my experience in the life insurance space and just right. knowing from a life expect expectancy standpoint women do live on average longer than men and i think that number is around seven to ten years of and probably longer now because people are living longer so the longer say males are living then women are living that much longer and yeah. so it's already it's already bad enough that your average american doesn't even have enough money to retire on by the yeah. time they reach 59, 65, 67 years old, and they're living longer. So if we're living longer, and then that means women are living longer than if the average male is, say, living to in their mid-70s, and women are in mid-80s, late-80s. Yeah. 
you know? So that was a huge paradigm for me to like sit back and say, okay, this is something we really need to create targeted content towards the, the women, the mothers out there, the wives that maybe aren't the sole provider. Maybe they contribute a a portion of it. And as we know, majority of men do provide in, in the household typically. Right. Mm -hmm. And there is, been a massive increase in women uh, entering into sole providing roles, especially with the uh, epidemic of fatherlessness in, in households today. So that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we don't have to get into. But that statement that you made radically has shifted how I've been talking to my female clients, moms, wives, and just women in general. Uh, yeah. It's been I've been really touching on that, letting them know this is going to be an issue for you. Let's figure it out now, early on, 100%. right? So yeah. really like well, that. And that's, and that's, that. First of all, thank you. And I can't take credit for that statement. That's Tom Hegna made that statement years ago, but it's so true because being somebody in the retirement space, I have the benefit of working with people in their nineties. Uh, I even have a couple of centurions. You know, I have the benefit of seeing the other side. And for every one 90 year old male client I have, I have nine women. I mean, that's just the reality. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that's, the, you know, that's what we're dealing with. And, and so women do live longer and they live with the consequences, as Tom would say, both good or bad of the planning they do as a household together or with the partner in their life. And so, you know, it's really important because I spend a lot of time with widows, recently divorced women, um, you know, and, and I really have a passion uh, for taking care of them and making sure that they have everything they need to live their lifestyle as comfortably as they want to for the rest of their life. And it's, it's not very complex. There's a great process we use to help make sure that they're secure. And when I noticed that you specialize in really helping um, women entrepreneurs and you have a heart for that as well, given your story and everything you share with me, I thought, you know, this would be great if we could start to have this conversation earlier, because the more proactive we can be, the better job I believe we can do. Absolutely. So with that, I want to take it to the whiteboard. I've got a, I've got a case right. study I want to present to you. And it's actually really sure. fresh in my mind because I just had a phone call with this client. Sure. And I think it's going to really benefit the audience that is watching. And just so you know who the audience is, typically it's a 50-50 split between male and female. And we're, okay. you're talking to people in the mid 40s to 50s 60s and up right and obviously you know my passion is working with moms single moms divorced moms widows just moms in general women in general that yeah. want to improve their household economy they want to you know really solve these problems that they're going to have to to deal with and then when yeah. also when I'm also working with the the husband and wife together just having that awareness that it's more likely that you know wife will be here longer than husband. So husband needs to do everything in his power to create that generational wealth to pass on. But even passing on wealth is not the final answer. It's also how do we steward that wealth? So if wife has no clue how to deal with money, and now she's got to learn it at 75 years old, 65 years old. And that's typically, honestly, that's the reality is I'm dealing with a lot of people in their late 50s, 60s, late 40s, that are just learning about the basics of, of finance. You know, I'm helping them, you know, get out of debt, get their cash right, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So this is going to definitely be a little more advanced, but I know that my particular audience, the loyal subscribers and clients are really going to get a lot of value from this. And also Good. if you're brand new for the first time watching this, you're definitely going to want to take some time aside. This is one more of an in-depth type of a masterclass here slash collaboration with with Daniel and he's going to provide some insight some things that can add to all the things that I'm already already doing which you're in alignment with right yeah so let's let's take this to the whiteboard i want to make sure you okay. can see this nice and clear right can you see everything nice and clear on your see end what we got here yeah i like the uh, i'm honored to be a part of the famous whiteboard setup for the first time <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to start on the left-hand side. These are the okay. four numbers, the the income. We're dealing with a 62-year-old uh, woman here okay. has has a um a 92-year-old mother that she takes care of and she has two disabled brothers. So she has three people that she is, you know, 
responsible for. She's kind of like okay. the head person dealing with most of the financial decisions and, and moves. So her total income coming in is seven thousand six forty eight net per month. Net. Our okay. our total expenses are seven thousand thirty seven dollars and a penny. That's on you yeah. know average each month. And we have a total total debt amount of three hundred eighty four thousand two hundred seventy dollars forty eight cents with a net monthly cash flow of six hundred ten dollars and ninety nine cents right okay. her goal was uh, when she was on the phone with me some of the primary things she wants to solve for is paying off debt right she wants to kind of you know eliminate some debt but she also wants to plan for retirement she wants to figure out how much money do sure. i need to accumulate to retire by the age of around 65 so like a goal is 65 three okay. years from now that's that's the goal okay. But she's okay. she's a realist. She's like, she, you know, I understand if I need to go longer, I'm more than happy to. And to give yeah. you a little more context, she is absolutely in love with what she does. So she doesn't have a desire to necessarily okay. just completely stop working. But okay. she does want to be able to say, I want to work. I don't have to work, right? Okay. I want to work and not have to work 40, 50 hour weeks and yeah. still have above and beyond left over to you know cover the cost of living etc so that's just give, you know giving that context some okay. other additional some other additional numbers here we have $62,000 cash on hand savings liquid okay. and we have a 403b 364,000 built in there i don't know exactly how much she's contributing she didn't know either so she was going to check on that for okay. me um, so we're but I do know that money is going into that, right? Okay. And I'm working on getting additional numbers. But that's where we're currently at. And then this is the debt breakdown. We have we have two timeshares working on getting the interest rates. But okay. I can I can almost guarantee that the interest rates are uh, double digits, so probably like above twelve or thirteen. They're really high. She has a personal loan on a credit card, eight point nine nine percent. We got a car loan, 2.49%, but the payment's pretty high. Mm -hmm. And we have that mortgage, 305, yep. about a half a K, half a mil in equity. And the maturity okay. date, maturity date is December 1st of 2050. And we have a really low rate on that at 2.5%. Okay. So okay. based on the discussion that we had, some of the first action moves, and you let me know if you're in agreement with this or if you would do things a little bit differently. Sure. Is we're we're shooting for immediate wins, okay. recovery recovery of cash flow, and I'm okay. also looking at how I can help her keep more of the money she already makes. So I'm analyzing all the bills and seeing, you know, where where could we uh, reduce waste and could we switch, you know, a phone company or car insurance or could we save money on car insurance by taking a defensive driver's course or something like that. So little things like that, or, you know, to recover cash flow, those are like our quick wins, quick moves. Okay. Um, this woman has a lot of available credit cards that we can leverage, so we're looking through all the different opportunities. But I one in particular, I saw that we could probably do a balance transfer on a credit card. She has a, a credit limit of like twenty five thousand. Yeah. On a, on a card, zero balance, not using it. Right. She has no credit card debt. Um, she is running bills through a credit card for cashback rewards. So that's okay. cool. Uh, so she's, you know, recovering some cash flow there. But with okay. this one credit card, I think it's Bank of America, they typically do like a 3% balance transfer or convenience check. And I was I was thinking an immediate like win would be to actually move the two timeshare debts and just stick them on a 0% credit card for 12 months, pay the monthly minimum, and then also leverage a home equity line of credit. We have a bunch of equity in there yep and i'm looking uh, we're in we're in florida so okay. there's a there's a bank called space coast credit union and they're doing a 4.24 percent intro rate for the first 12 months on a cool. home equity line of credit yeah that's like a really great rate in this environment yeah. as yeah. you know and we can lock that in for 12 months so you know 12 months okay. from now hopefully rates do eventually come down a little bit and that'll improve the situation even more so yeah. i was telling her let's research banks Let's look for a home equity line of credit that we could, 
you know, acquire. Her credit score is like 800 or okay. high seven, so great credit. And I was saying, okay, the second move after moving the two timeshares, paying those off, sticking mm-hmm. in the credit card, you're gonna net, you're gonna net a $252 cash flow gain from the 226 and 191.80. Okay. Right. And then you just pay the 165, and now you're on zero percent for 12 months. Cool. Cool. Yep. Then the home equity line of credit, this is where we can start doing velocity banking. And I was thinking that we could move the loan that's at 8.99%, cut that in half, stick it in 4.24, recapture that 402. And then over the next 12 months, we just do straight velocity banking to to knock that balance down as quickly as possible so that we have the room to then wipe out the credit card once that expires. Right. That makes sense to me. Right. And then once that expires, then, you know, we do it again. And within a 24 month period or less, we could wipe out three whole entire debts. And that increases our cash flow to, I think, around twelve or thirteen hundred dollars. Um, nice. Last time I uh, checked the math here and our borrowing costs when we owe in the neighborhood of around twenty four, twenty three thousand. If we keep it around that range, yeah. our our net borrowing costs. This is overestimated. It's only only around seventy five dollars a month, and mm-hmm. every month, every month thereafter, it keeps dropping mm-hmm. by like eight to ten bucks, which okay. is you know super super low. Um, yeah. Now at this point, all we did was just solve for recovering cash flow, paying down debt, reduce expenses a little bit, try to get that cash flow you know, up. But now where I think you can come in and provide a a lot of really good insight here is as we're doing this, which I think you're in agreement with, you like this so far. Great short term win. I like it. Yeah. Right. Cool. While she's doing this over the next 24 months or less, we could wipe out, you know, a lot of debt. And then we're just going to be left with that low car rate loan and that low mortgage. During that time, how could we be educating this woman on hitting that goal of getting to that retirement income number. And I think this is where everything I just said, I did not use anything of the 403B and I didn't use any of her savings. So I had mentioned the possibility of while we're doing this, Mm -hmm. maybe maybe obtaining some kind of life insurance, right? She does not have enough death benefit coverage to cover all her her debt. I think she has like a $25,000 death benefit with her, you know, employer and I think maybe some some more okay. but does not have n- nowhere near enough to cover her human life value so I was like I was like I definitely want to have a conversation on that. That's when I yeah. literally at that point once we get out of velocity banking, I then refer people, yeah. people to you, people to Caleb, people to, you know, different yeah. YouTube channels that can have the life insurance conversation in conjunction yeah. with what we're doing here on a day to day. And then I'm just like like holding them accountable to their numbers. Right. So based on that, what, what would you present or knowing that we have this savings and we have this 403B here, what are some questions that you're going to want to know that maybe I could answer here? Definitely. Um, Well, first of all, I'm super excited. This is a perfect case study. And I love that you've tackled some short-term wins. Obviously you bring a ton of value in that analysis that you do to improve cash flow and help people to be efficient with their debts and, and paying off their money in velocity banking. So I think you've done an, an expert analysis. Um, and one thing I'd love to point out too, and I'm not just saying this because you've hosted me on your channel, like you're not gonna get what you just did for people from, I don't know the percentage, but a large percentage of financial professionals offices. Like that quick analysis you just did is so valuable. And that's one of the reasons why I love working with you so far is like, you're gonna, people are trusting financial professionals to give them expert guidance. And they're not gonna get that from a lot of people that they're currently going to. I mean, and I know that because I meet with a ton of people. I, I run about 25 meetings a week. And so I've gotten to meet with, you know, over a thousand families in my career so far. I've I very rarely have I seen anybody do a velocity banking analysis the way you just did. I very rarely. I mean, again, I can't speak to the percentage, but. So that right there is powerful. Um, now, let me just say a couple things. Um, I want to introduce our process because I think that's very important. And again, our process is the one that Tom Hegna created. It works. There's no reason to reinvent it. It's incredible and it's it's very sound. Um, I have to give just a quick disclaimer. Like, obviously, I don't know this lady. Um, I'm not meeting with her. I haven't asked her the proper questions. I don't know the disclaimers. Right. Like, obviously, this isn't like legal, financial, or tax advice. 
but I will run through the process. And I will say this too, we kind of mimic the idea of a family office at Nations First Financial. And what I mean by that is we have expert people who do velocity banking in terms of the first lien HELOC strategy. We have people who specialize in the reverse strategy. We have CPAs, tax attorneys, fully fiduciary advisors, estate planning attorneys. So when I'm meeting with a client, like, you know, these people aren't employed by me, but I bring in a team around them. So if I need to reference some strategy, that person can do it for me with their expertise um, versus, you know, me trying to do it all. And, and, you know, I only do a very specific part of the retirement income portion where we're removing risk. So I'll do my best here, but normally I would have like, you know, my team with me where I could really right. like, you know, do a lot. But I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying this for this for this woman. You've already identified one of the first questions is, what is the time horizon you have to retirement? Uh, the second question I would ask is, how much income will she need at that point to cover all of her basic needs and expenses to live her lifestyle? So that would be my first question that I would need to know. Um, and I know you put up there her expenses, but obviously with you doing some of this velocity banking movement, that's gonna change, right? It's gonna, like it's gonna, it's gonna reduce her cost reduce. of living. And so to give yeah. you the math on that, yeah. I went ahead and did a cost of living adjustment of 4% increase each year till age okay. 65, 66. And yeah. this was this was based on paying off no debt. So still having oh. the debt just okay. to like let her know like this would be like a very overestimated number. And if yeah. we if we fall short, we would still be okay because of all this debt that we would be eliminating. Yeah. But I also explained to her that even though we're eliminating debt and quote unquote reducing expenses, it's yeah. you're you're still going to lose cash flow year over year because right. your cost of living increase unless yeah. we increase our income equal to or more than inflation, taxation, devaluation of the currency, you know, all that stuff. And that's, right. you know, really, really hard math to basically run. So by age 66, yep. her cost of living would be $8,232.28. And that's 4% increase year over year. Mm -hmm. And then if we minus the cash flow gain, so 8,232.28, we minus 226, paid off that timeshare, minus 191.80 and then minus the 402, right? And that's just paying off three debts. I'm fairly yeah. confident we could eliminate the car by age 65, 66. So that's another 820. So yeah. on on the on the low end, we would need to have at least $7,500 in uh, income to cover the cost of living and also the debt payments, you know, her mortgage payment. We'd still have that mortgage payment. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it factors in property increase, you know, her timeshares, those are going to increase over the years, um, yeah. all that. So that, that would, that's the number. I'm, I'm saying on the low end, we need at least $7,500 okay. of, of income to, to cover everything. But just yeah. know that there's some wiggle room if we fall slightly short of that number. But that would be the goal. So at least 7,500 on the high end, 8,200 is now above and beyond what we okay. would need. And I would I call that financial independence if I yeah. have at least over eighty two, eighty three hundred dollars coming in. Okay. That I don't necessarily have to work for. Then yeah. I would I would declare this woman financially independent. Okay. And then anything above that number is, is going to be definitely icing on the cake, you know, with everything okay. else that she has going on. Okay. That so that helps tremendously. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying this retirement is a income solution, right? Like it's, a, it's, you're solving for income, not necessarily assets. It's much more about cash flow and right. income than it is about how much you've saved. So I think that we can be very encouraging to this woman because, um, she's done a good job of saving. She's done a good job being a good steward. She's got some debt. She's coming to you to figure out how to do things a little bit more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, let me share our, the process with you that we use. And I think it'll give clarity, bring clarity to like everything in my thought process to help this woman here. So Beautiful. there's there's two steps here that, that Tom has masterfully outlined. Uh, and the outcome is always different because everybody's situation is unique. They have different needs and objectives, but the process is always the same. Step one is making sure they have enough guaranteed lifetime income for the rest of their life to cover all their basic needs and expenses. And the reason why you have to have guaranteed lifetime income is because it is 
mathematically impossible to optimize the withdrawals from a portfolio over the indefinite period of a human life. It can't be done. You know, you can build models with success ratios and say, okay, if you have this much money and it grows like this and you take out this, then here's the probability you won't run out of money. But that's typically falling short for a lot of different people. I mean, you know, if you're a multimillionaire, uh, you're probably going to be okay with that model in some scenarios, depending on the model. But for somebody we really need to be very intentional with, like this case study here for this woman, yeah. um, Tom's process makes a lot of sense. So guaranteed lifetime income, there's three pillars. Social security, it's a guaranteed income stream for the rest of your life by the government. Pension, it's going to be guaranteed by the employer's pension group for the rest of your life. And then an annuity, right? And an annuity is just a lifetime stream of income. That's really at its core what it's designed to do. So, you know, once upon a time in America, everybody got a pension. You worked for a company for 30 years. You don't even have to think about it. You get 80% of your income for you and your spouse for the rest of your life. There was no retirement crisis. Then they introduced the 401k in the late 80s. All of a sudden, people were responsible for knowing how to invest money, how much to put in, how much they can take out. Fast forward to today, no shock. The experiment isn't working. There's a retirement crisis. People are running out of money. So, you know, now it's up to us to create our own lifetime income streams. So the first thing I'd want to know is what is her social security? And we'd want to do a full report on what it's going to be at different ages so that we can uh, understand those ages in relation to when she should be retiring. Gotcha. So we're going and to you, want to know and before, before, before you go further, yeah. is there something that the audience can do say yeah. right now to yeah. look up what their projected social security would be? Is there a website for that? And if so, yes. let me know what that is and I'll make sure to put it in the description and comments on that. Yeah, this is one thing I require from all my clients is to go to ssa.gov. Okay. You create an account. They have an ID me process similar to the IRS and you can go download your earnings record. And your earnings record is this green and white statement they used to mail out to everybody every single year. Now you download it. Some people still get it depending on if you're in civil service or different industries still get it. But um, it'll tell you what you've paid into social security. It will also tell you what to anticipate from Social Security at different ages. Mm. And so that document is really important because Social Security for most Americans is going to be the cornerstone of their retirement income. Yeah. So I meet a lot of people who go, oh, I got a retirement income plan all set up. I'm good. And I go, perfect. What's your Social Security going to be and what age are you going to take it to maximize it? And they go, oh, we didn't cover that. And I'm like, well, then you don't have a retirement income plan. <laughs> so. Social security is important. The next phase would be we look at the pension. Okay. You know, which pension. which in this case is her 403B. Yes. Okay. So she's got a retirement account. She doesn't have like a. a she a, doesn't have know, no no a defined you know pension plan. So some people have them, some people don't. That's the second step of analysis for anybody who's watching who does have a pension. You're going to get all these choices on how you want to take your pension in right. relation to you and a beneficiary, typically your spouse, and so you can get higher amounts of pensions. Uh, for based just on your life. And then there's survivorship options. There might be what they call, you know, period certain options where you just get a check for 20 years and then it stops. And, and, and it takes a, a team to go through and, and evaluate what's going to be the most appropriate option based on your circumstances. So that's that's step two of, of the, the, the mini step of step one is look at the pension. Whatever the shortfall is, whatever you need between Social Security pension and that income, that expense number you gave me. And again, this is assuming we don't do anything on the velocity banking to you know help right. improve cash flow. That's where the annuity goes because that annuity yeah. income payment is going to be the consistent lifetime income that someone needs so that they can retire and stay retired regardless of what's happening in the economy, who the president is. You know, I can't mess it up. It's just a stable check that they're going to get for the rest of their life. That's going to protect them as they age into their 90s, knowing that, hey, my income is secure and I'm going to have enough forever. The other thing it's going to do is touch on what I talked about in the beginning of our, our conversation, which was creating some uh, fulfillment and happiness and allowing them to maintain that abundance mindset. Yes. Because if you have a check coming in every month, you know it's coming in like clockwork. You could spend it the whole month and then know it's coming right back to replenish it. So, you know, we have clients that are multimillionaires who ran very successful businesses uh, who retire with plenty in assets, but because it's left up to them to decide how much they can spend and they don't really have a, you know, consistent check, they end up delaying a lot of satisfaction. They live what we call a just in case retirement where, you know, they don't do things in the early parts of their retirement because they're always worried about, well, what if I need this money down the road? On the flip side, I have people who are teachers and she may be a, a, 
uh, in education. She has a fourth so degree. So she uh, is she does work at a university. Okay. And she's part of like a uh, business development incubation yeah. and works with startups, kind yeah. of thing. So she she definitely has a good mindset of of abundance, and I'm just kind of feeding into that. So that's um, perfect. Something solid there. So, just want to be more context. So I've had people who are teachers who made way less money than the entrepreneurs, but they got pensions. And mm -hmm. you know, I can tell they're much happier because they can know confidently what they can spend. They can give confidently at the level they want to give at without fear. Right. And so that's a big part of this process is if you have that first step covered, we know you're not going to run out of money. And longevity risk uh, is really a very significant risk to deal with because the longer you live, the higher the probability that something else is going to go wrong, which brings us to step two of our process, which is once we know we have enough lifetime income, then all we do is remove the other key risks that could mess up that income. So what are those? Well, what if they lose money? Will that impact their income? You know, what if interest rates rise or fall? Will that impact their income? What if taxes go up? Will that lower their income? What if inflation goes up, right? What if one spouse predeceases the other? What if they have a long-term care event? What about concentration risk? Do they have too much of their assets in any one thing? If it fails, that would damage their income. If you follow that two-step process, and this is all Tom Hagner, by the way, then what happens is you find that the probability of failing in retirement is very low. Like short of somebody going out and developing a gambling or drug addiction, it's hard to mess that up. If you cover all your bases and you have a strategic bucket for every single thing using the least amount of money possible to solve for that risk, then it's hard to run out of money. And so risk is just the probability something can go wrong. So if you build a retirement income where there's risk on the table, you're inviting in the probability that something can go wrong. And if Murphy's law has taught us anything, what can go wrong probably will go wrong. Mm -hmm. If we can just systematically remove all those key things, they're going to have a secure retirement. Now, there's pre-retirement risks as well. What if you become disabled and you can't work? What if you lose your job? What if you die, right? I mean, there's other risks that we need to neutralize to make sure that we can get her to that point as well. Mm -hmm. So for her search, so let's bring it back down to her situation specifically. That's the process we would outline. So for her, if she's got this goal of 65 and we know she needs you know, 8,600 a month, we got to pull social security to figure out how much of that income is going to be covered there. And then with the other portion of our assets, we need to figure out how much we could utilize in a lifetime income annuity to get her as close to that number as possible. Now, just based on what you share with me in that short of a time horizon, the math isn't going to work right there. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, we're not going to be able to get there. So what can we do for her? Well, she has a couple options, right? Maybe we bring in our uh, mortgage specialist to look at a HECM. Now, again, I don't know her priorities. Maybe that's not in alignment with what she's looking to accomplish. Maybe equity is more important than cash flow. And if that's the case, that may not be appropriate to even evaluate. Mm -hmm. But if it is, that may be one of the most significant levers she could pull because in being somebody who studies retirement income, there's only two levers to improve your retirement income. You can either increase the distribution from assets for income or decrease the monthly obligations from liabilities. That's all we have. <laughs> and so I spend a tremendous amount of time like you do in the liability side, trying to help improve cash flow because as we know, you know, financial institutions typically stack it in their favor. A lot of times you're, you're better off paying off debt than trying to create income because it's, it's hard to create cash flow. It's, it, and the debt is very significant on a monthly basis. So I'm not saying that she should do that. I'm just saying if she wants to meet her goal and maybe with the velocity banking for the next three years, if we could get rid of enough of those liabilities to get her to those limits of maybe where a HECM might apply, that may be a strategy to significantly boost cash flow. And now if we look at social security, we look at reducing the mortgage payment, we look at lifetime income from an annuity, we might be able to get closer there. I think just off the top of my head, without running any numbers, she's probably going to need to work a little longer than 65. Would be yeah. would be my unless she has a massive social security payment. Um, <laughs> I, it's probably going to need to be a little right. bit longer. But at and least she, we she's can very aware of that as well. She's very aware of that. Yeah. And yeah. her solution is um, she has a daughter, and okay. the two of them want to team up and start a business together. Oh. And she is also uh, very interested in coaching people uh, in startups. You know, so I'm like, okay, there's speaking opportunities, there's consulting opportunities there, there's yeah. curriculum opportunities there to yeah. generate a, a combination of active and passive income. It's not fully passive, but that's, you know, activity in an area that she already loves 
doing. So I feel like that will definitely help, which is just increase the income in the next three years. The the other thing is you brought into the conversation a HECM, which stands Mm -hmm. for a home equity conversion mortgage. This is not something that I consistently talk about on my channel. So I definitely wanted to just touch on that a little bit and then define that. So that's a home equity conversion mortgage. Can you explain the difference between a HECM and a say a first lien HELOC and Ooh, okay. you know what would be some sure. pros to a HECM over a, over a first lien and then I can touch you, on. You are, you are touching on one of my favorite subjects to talk about um, by far. So quick, another quick thing I just want to throw out there, like I meet with people three to four times before I ever recommend anything. So like I can't recommend anything obviously on the spot here, but right. I just want to throw out ideas. So yeah, we can have that's a better the purpose of this. Yeah. To get, get so the brains so again, to I'm it. not a mortgage broker, like quick disclaimer, I'm not licensed to do mortgages. Um, but the reason why I think they're so important is because health insurance and mortgages are the two biggest barriers to people's retirement these days. I mean, those are the two big expenses for most people. So yeah. if she can start a business with her daughter, and start bringing in maybe five grand a month. I mean, that could be the difference, right? Now that's not reliable and sustainable income. I mean, entrepreneurs take a ton of risk. I mean, that's the definition of being an entrepreneur. So (laughs) typically for entrepreneurs, this process lends a lot of security to them because they're taking on so much risk in their life with their business. They want to remove risk so that they can retire comfortably because when they're 90, they won't be able to do the things they're doing in their 60s. Um, and so, you know, the HECM versus HELOC, and that could be a whole, that, that is a whole other video, but a home equity conversion mortgage is essentially a reverse line of credit. And the reason why I think that that is powerful for some people who are trying to prepare for retirement is because it's a cash flow tool. I mean, it, it's going to uh, stop the mortgage payment. Now, obviously, you're still responsible for taxes and insurance, right? I mean, you know, but to 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 stop the uh, monthly payment, that might be something that provides value to somebody. Um, whereas the first lien HELOC, in my mind, uh, which is what I own now, obviously, I'm not 62, so I can't even consider a HECM. But when I am 62, I can tell you that if all things equal, that's the mortgage I'll have when I'm 62. Um, but, but pr- prior to age 62, I use the first lien HELOC because it gives me a lot of the principles right. that I really want to have in my life. The difference to me, and, and you could probably speak better to this than I could, but to me, the difference is, um, you're going to be, um, first of all, if it's an all in one, I think that's a key distinction. Uh, you're going to be able to do things that you currently just can't do. I mean, the all in one allows you, and that's what I have. Uh, you know, to work with your pre-expense income. And here's what I mean by that. Most Americans saving for retirement are saving with their after tax, after expense income, which for a lot of people is only like 10 to 20% of their, their net income. So that's, it's hard to move the needle with 10% of net income for a lot of people, especially if expenses are really high. So, you know, for most people, they, before they get their check, they have taxes that come out, money goes to a checking account, they leave so much in for their bills every month, and then they pull the rest out to save and pay down debts beyond that. That's working with your after expense income. The first lien HELOC, the reason why I love it, is to me, it's the only tool that I can really use that automatically helps me work with my pre-expense income. So I'm getting credits every day of the month for money that I'm gonna spend on what I need to spend it on anyway, but now I get to take advantage of some of that. And if you're a high earner, that can be a game changer. Yeah. So you know, I think that that's going to give you some things that you won't get, Plus, to me, the first thing HELOC is about accelerating down the debt to own it free and clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas the HECM is going to not do that at all. You're going to still, you know, it's a different kind of debt, but it's a, it's going to be a very big uh, cash flow flip for someone. So I'm not here to say one's right or wrong or one's better for this lady right. or the other. I think that a lot of people could benefit from, which is what I'm doing personally, First lien HELOC to Heckam. You know, I think that could be a really powerful play so, that I don't see a lot of people touching on as well. Yeah, and, uh, and, and definitely not something that I have been diving into, which is why true. I have you here to be yeah. able to expand on that a little more. So yeah. in this case, we yeah. are potentially most likely going to start with a second position home equity line of credit to eliminate those initial debts. 
right? Yeah. And just taking it back to the whiteboard here so everyone can see. Let's go back. And once I reach age 65, depending on how much debt I've eliminated, let's say everything is paid off except yeah. for the mortgage. So that means I got the car paid off. I got that 820 back. So my cash flow is even much higher, probably around like 2K plus. And then considering in those three years, maybe I get a pay, res, pay raise promotion, maybe some bonuses, who knows, right? There, there yeah. could be additional money there, but not even including any of that. By age 65, I'm pretty sure the value of this property would have increased even more, right? Okay. A couple of years from now, maybe not so much higher, but you know, an extra maybe 10, 20 plus thousand ish. Sure. Or, and I think it depends on what happens with interest rates, right? I mean, we don't it, know yet. It, exactly. And yeah. maybe within those three years, we converted from a second lien to a first lien. Either we do that or we can pull on the Heckam lever, which would remove not the whole entire 2,341.14, but the principal and interest payment would be eliminated is what you're saying if I yeah. pull on a home equity conversion mortgage. Now, that's one thing that happens. Now, with this home equity conversion mortgage, so my audience yeah. understands this a little bit more clearly, what exactly mm -hmm. are we doing with this mortgage? What is the end result? Once I've pulled on this, is, is, is this something I pull on forever? Does it eventually yeah. run out? Yeah. So again, a couple of things here. There's too, there's too many unknowns for this lady to really solve anything directly right here with the mortgage. And here's why. If she's starting a business, right? I, don't, I wouldn't even bring in my mortgage broker at this stage yet, right? I mean, we right. got to know what's going to happen yet. with that. It's going to be a year probably before she profits, depending on what kind of business. She, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things here. So it's got to have a lot of flexibility. This is why I try to build relationships. Like, I'm much more about building relationships and working with my clients intentionally all the time right. because th things are going to change for this lady a lot in between now and retirement, starting a business. I mean, there's so many things. So we got to have a lot of flexibility. We can't make any too, like too many rigid moves right now with the right. mortgage. But I will answer your question. I would bring in two professionals in this circumstance. I'd bring in my first lien HELOC guy and I'd bring in my Heckam lady that I work with, right? And and they're incredible. and um, you know, I didn't get your permission to share with you, share their names. So that's why I'm referring to them in that way on your channel. But, okay. um, they would do an analysis. Like they would just sit down with her and say, what's in your best interest that aligns with your priorities. that makes the most sense for you mathematically. Mm -hmm. I would leave that to them. I'd stay completely out of that. But right. the re end result of the Heckam is unknown. And here's why we don't know what the property value is going to do over her lifetime. Um, what's going to happen with the Heckam is um, she probably doesn't have enough equity, even with the appreciation and velocity banking strategy to actually pull anything out at this stage. Right. Um, but she might, and, and probably not even, but she might have enough to just stop the mortgage payment. Yeah. So with so the let's, mortgage payment, yeah, let's, let's go back to the whiteboard. Yeah. Let's just talk about that a little bit. So the Heckam is a yeah. cash flow tool. It, yeah. Potentially. It, yeah. If she gets, right. if she gets access to the line, it could be, yeah. But, but no, it's a cash flow tool in the sense that it'll, improve cash flow by Correct. stopping the mortgage payment of principal and right. interest. So yep. it stops it stops the payment. Yeah. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, you have to have at least 50% or more in equity. Correct. It's changed a little bit, I think. And again, this is out of my area of expertise, but I think it's that's the rough kind of number, but it depends right. on age and interest rates and stuff like that. Right. So, I, so, but so yeah, we can just as an example, use that definitely probably. say at least definitely over 50 plus percent has to be yeah. in available equity in the property. Equity. And yeah. so now let's just say someone did this or someone has this. At, at this point, what is what is happening once the payment stops? Do I now get a, a certain amount of money that I choose to pull out or is it a set amount? They, I think they determine the line of credit based on what, what the parameters are. And it goes based on age, interest rates, and equity. So I think they would determine what you're eligible as like a draw. Okay. Now, um, the Heckam's kind of cool because your potential line of credit can grow by your interest rate every year. So people can theoretically have more line utilization down the road, um, depending on a couple of different factors. So for her, I, I think that's in this specific example, that's a potential benefit, but really it would just be, you know, part of that 2341 is taxes and insurance. I don't know how much is escrow, you know, a portion of that would be reduced. And I think that would, you know, exponentially get her to her goal. Like I look at it like this, and this is where I spend a lot of time with my mortgage experts, right? 
let's say that out of that 2300 and again i don't know property tax in florida let's say i mean let's just say you know 500 of that is taxes and insurance i guess I, you know whatever yeah so let's say that you know 1800 1850 a month is principal and interest right mm -hmm. how much would she need to put into something to generate 1850 a month net of taxes net of fees net of risk every single month very right. hard that, to do a lot of money yeah. right <laughs> a lot of money we're, we're, so, we're talking multiple six figures i mean yeah just so to, to get that result in cash flow i think a mortgage broker is better handling this than somebody like me or the financial advisor right like you yeah. know because they can make a bigger impact to her retirement than i could so yeah. that's why i spent a lot of time having them come in and do analysis for her i think that analysis at a certain point would be very appropriate because you know, we just don't know. We don't, we don't know what gotcha. it's going to look like. If, if her numbers were closer to like 600 in value and 250 in debt, then I think she'd probably be more of a candidate, uh, based on, you know, okay. what the mortgage brokers have been instructing me on. But yeah, I mean, you can see how much of an impact it would make for her in retirement. For sure. So as of right now, obviously the Heckam wouldn't make sense and it may not even make sense three years from now, but maybe a year or two, it just depends on how quickly we can move with the, the velocity banking method here. Now, right. The, the, the other thing is once you do a Heckam, your mm -hmm. intention should no longer be to try to pay this off, right? Like you're going to, like if I pass away and I was using yeah. a Heckam from age mm -hmm. 65 through 70s and 80s, yeah. what happens to the home when I, when I pass away? You know, it's a great question. And, and here's where I think I could share a lot of value because I do have a lot of clients. I've settled, I've helped a lot of families to, uh, I don't settle estates because I'm not an attorney, but I've helped them to settle, you know, their affairs and, you know, you know, process claims on different things for, for families once somebody passes away. And so I personally, the reason why I want to heck them for me at 62 and my wife is that asset for a lot of people, the house becomes frustrating. So the reason why I went out and wrote a couple books about retirement was after meeting with a thousand families, I realized the common scenario in America is people are retiring with a 401k, 403b, 457, whatever, a retirement account and a home. Some people it's paid off, some people it's not. And if things keep going the way they're going, people are gonna need more income at some point. That's why I'm out on a mission trying to raise awareness and writing books and doing things like that. When somebody passes away, or, or let's just say someone's in retirement, right? Their home, can be frustrating because they see all this equity yeah. that's in the house and they don't know how to use it wisely. They don't know how to actually enjoy life while they can in the good early years. Mm -hmm. They're saving it all for the end, right? I personally at 62 would love the idea of making memories with my two daughters, having that fund certain things for my lifestyle and then leaving my girl's life insurance because helping so many families that have come in after their parents are gone, I don't, maybe a couple times have siblings negotiated with another sibling to let someone live in the family home? Nine times out of 10, they sell the home and move on. Life insurance is a wealth transfer vehicle. I'd rather give my girls life insurance, you know, tax-free in one lump sum than a house. So, you know, for me personally, I like the idea of intentionally making memories and doing things while my wife and I are healthy with my daughters, my future grandkids one day, and then just leaving them life insurance. So okay. the end result would probably be, I can't speculate. I have no idea what the house is going to be appreciate by over her lifetime, but let's just say there's no equity left, but it freed up 1800 a month for 30 years. I mean, there's that's a trade off there. And that's tax free because you're pulling debt essentially. So that's, that's not tax. Yeah, you're just wiping off a liability that's going out. So that's right. not even. Yeah. So, so this is interesting, right? So what, so what happens here? is yeah. we can potentially use the the client's home that let's yeah. say we accelerated early on in life, or maybe we didn't accelerate it. We just kind of let it be and it naturally got paid down. Yeah. And if there's enough space, we do this, say, Heckam that yeah. can almost assure us because it, it didn't make it into the guaranteed lifetime income column. I, I, I noticed that in terms of how you were explaining it. So <laughs> it's not considered a guaranteed lifetime income, but it yeah. certainly does provide a nice boost for a certain period of time for sure that, that could be mapped out. So let's just say yeah. it, it was good for like a good 20, 25 years or so. And yeah. then this client passes away. Mm -hmm. Now there's this huge debt on 
like it's almost like a restarted mortgage, right? I'm assuming. Yeah. So the balance, and, the, the whole deal with the reverse, my understanding of it is, is that the balance of her loan, that 300,000 is still going to accrue interest and that's going to eat into the equity one day. So whatever the balance, whatever the home's worth, plus all that interest on that existing balance, whatever's left, that's what her daughter would get as a result of her passing, right? If there's right. anything left, so there may say, not be anything left. It, right. It so let's say, just, you know, so let's say daughter now has this home. There's nothing left in it, right? Yeah. She now has to start making payments on. No, she, she no, she would just the, the house would basically just be sold and. She'd walk away. There'd be no. She'd have no obligation to it. She would have no obligation. To, the 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 home would just get sold if she gets nothing or a little bit of something. Fine. But let's say yeah. she wanted to keep the home. What would be yeah, the, the strategy she, there? Yeah. She my, again. It goes different by state, and I'll be happy to bring our mortgage specialist on sometime to do this yeah, in yeah, better yeah. better way. But but I but my understanding is it, if it's like how it is in Arizona, she would get first right of refusal. So what would happen is you know. Okay, all of a sudden, let's say that she's done the proper estate planning and she either has a trust or a beneficiary deed in Florida. It might be called a warranty deed. Again, I'm not an estate planning attorney, but let's just say that she's the beneficiary of the house, right? So what's going to happen is the bank's going to go, okay, you know, here's the value. Let's say it's grown from 500 over a lifetime to like 1.2 million. And let's say the line of credit on that has just been growing, you know, rapidly. Um, and let's say that she owes... Um, you know, a million bucks, right? So the debt on the property is a million because it's still accruing interest. And let's say it's appreciated to like 1.2 over the next 30 years. You know, she would sell the house, net of the real estate commissions and any potential taxes or fees, she would get whatever's left. Let's say another scenario occurs where the house appreciated 1.2 and the debt and interest rates just were high, really high for the next 40 years. And let's say the house was upside down. She just walks away. But if she wanted to remortgage it, yes, she would have to come up with a mortgage to be able to remortgage the property and take it to keep her it. own name. Keep her own name. Yeah. But wow. she gets that choice. She gets that choice, right. She's not yeah. so it doesn't sound like in my mind I thought, oh man, is this gonna be a burden to the kid? Right. But it's actually not. She has well, first right of refusal to like states have FIFO laws and things that you know obli and again I, I again I just can't answer that I don't know okay but some states do have you know laws where you know there could be potential liabilities passed to heirs yeah. um you know that's going to be really more of a question for an estate planning attorney in your here's, state but, here's what but comes again, to mind. yeah so yeah I mean you could help make some introductions there in Florida but um for sure. you know, but you know no I mean that's the risk to the bank like okay. that's what I love about it. Let's say my house is upside down for my daughters one day. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the bank's risk. I'd rather just give them life insurance. And uh, okay, so let's touch on headache. that. So let's because now you get me excited because now I have an idea here. So okay, let's so let's, talk let's, about it. let's touch on the life insurance piece a little bit here because we so sure. just to recap. Yeah. Velocity banking in the beginning reduce expenses, increase cash flow. Um, in the first three years, we're from age sixty two to sixty five. We're we're yeah. getting these early early wins. We yeah. are going to SSA.gov. We're going to create an account, see how much guaranteed lifetime income we can get. Yeah. Um, this person doesn't have a pension. So the substitute of the pension is this 403B. So that'll come there. And then we can evaluate what kind of income stream that could produce. The annuity, we, we didn't touch on how that gets funded. And I wanted to real quick yeah. uh, talk about how does that get funded yeah. based on these numbers here? What and are you what are you clear, fine? That's my expertise. So I know I keep referring to like different professionals. I just want to be fully mm -hmm. transparent. Like when I work with somebody in a case study, I would have my team around me. The annuity is my piece. So all you would do is just your your column of pension, I would just put a zero there and move your 403B uh, uh, okay. down to the annuity. That's where okay. you would roll. So, so one thing she would want to check like on that. is, yeah, there's, there's other factors here. So we'd bring in our financial advisor to do a risk analysis for her, mm -hmm. right? And the financial advisor would determine her risk capacity with her and her risk tolerance. And so, you know, if, if, if that determination uh, and he instructs me to say, Hey, like, you know, it might be appropriate to use an annuity here to cover some of the, that income, then um, we would do that. And so she would want to check with her employer, the university, whoever is administering the 403B, she would call them and ask, does she have an in-service distribution provision? If she has an in-service distribution provision, what that means is she does not have to wait till separation of service to roll that money over. She could potentially roll that money into a lifetime income annuity now. And that's where that world gets kind of exciting because when we're talking about lifetime income annuities, 
there are many different options. So she could, you know, think about purchasing a lifetime income annuity with a income rider where she can basically just say, okay, I want this much income in three years. And then she can go, you know, just roll it into an annuity that'll do that, you know? Wow. So, okay. so there's not, there's not this, like a lot of people are not appropriate. And this makes me very nervous. And this is very sad. You hear of a lot of people that were going, I had 500 grand in 2007. I was just about to retire. And then the market wiped me out and I couldn't, I couldn't retire. I mean, how sad is that? Like it's, it breaks my heart because all that person had to do was sit with the appropriate team proactively. They would have never been in that circumstance in the first place. Right. And now they've worked all that time. I'm not laughing. I mean, I'm just uncomfortable with that situation because it makes me so sad. The years before she retires are crucial because if she makes a mistake and loses that money, I mean, that's what Tom Hagen always says. If you have enough money to retire, what's the worst thing you could do? Lose it. Lose it. Right. right. And mm -hmm. so, and so that would be devastating. So if she has the ability with her employer to do an in-service, uh, you know, it, withdrawals, uh, then she could roll it into an annuity and we could start to cover that bucket and yes. have some. Say the term that. again. So people can take notes in service distribution, in service distribution. Yeah. And you, and, okay. and what would happen is, you know, she would call up, they'd have a process, right? They'd want to verify her. They either have a form or she could do it over the phone. And, and, you know, and then they, they would basically just do a rollover to an IRA, an individual retirement account. So that transfer from 403B to IRA, she could just complete without needing to pay tax at the time. And then she could just roll it into an annuity if that was appropriate or whatever she needs to do to complete her strategy. Right. Um, so we would guarantee, would gotcha. So basically this money, if mm -hmm. this is available, it mm -hmm. would be wise to try to secure this money because this money is at risk. Sure, it can grow, but it can also lose quite a bit of money. But if I move, if I can move this money, you're saying yeah. potentially the earlier, the better, get it over in here, have that annuity start to grow. And by the time I'm ready to distribute, I would have, yeah. you know, increased more gains on it to have another guaranteed lever to pull on so annuity and social security got it then we yep. went in, then we went into heckam so now i'm gonna i'm gonna transition Wait, out of that before you transition okay. let me just say one thing go ahead and this is why it's so important to be clear about this right i don't i've never seen this 403b i have no idea how it's allocated she might be in something that you know is potentially safe i don't know what i'm saying is i think it's important to identify your time horizon and what you're comfortable with risk in relation to what you need to have for retirement income. And so the annuity might not be, a, it's, it's, I mean, truly really not a great growth vehicle in my mind, but just like social security will defer, the longer you defer, the higher your payment is, there's, there's annuities that work like that. So basically you could say, okay, if we roll over 200,000 or an, as an example, just an arbitrary number, um, you know, we know that in this amount of years, the insurance company will provide more and more income based on my age. And so you can get, you can start to build like a trajectory. You can start to have some certainty around what's my income going to be at certain ages, just like we were doing with social security earlier. Gotcha. Okay. So let's so now we move to heck I'm sorry. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, all right. So we got some, we got some really good work here. Um, cool. A lot of, a lot that we've been pouring into the audience here. And I know you guys are going to cool. have to hit pause a couple different times and see the different, components. First step was solving for that guaranteed lifetime income as we get older. And then how to fund the annuity, it's most likely going to come from this money over here. We still have that savings and we didn't touch on life insurance, but you mentioned it a couple of times. So there's also yeah, yeah. the the life insurance piece, which is that tool which helps us on the way to becoming fully retired. Yeah. If something happens, this is a tool that can protect the vulnerabilities in our lives. So some, yep. some big risk that she has on her hands, she has three people she's responsible for. Her yeah. elderly mom, 92 years old, and she's got two brothers. Anything happens to any one of them, they don't have life insurance. Now it's gonna be a big expense on her. So there's a combination, I'm assuming that if, if you're in, this is what I'm thinking yep. in my mind, some of this 62,000 
should be dedicated to life insurance on herself and then some type of protection that we can potentially get on her siblings and her mother if possible. I know she's older, 92 years old, but this particular family has a very, very long uh, track record of yeah. living of living long. Um, yeah. She's got a, I think, a grandmother that's in the hundreds. Her mom's mom made it to over a hundred. Her yeah. current mom is pr- like really healthy, passing all the all the health checks for a 92 year old woman. So she projects that her mom should make it to a hundred. So yeah. you know, there, there's some uh, big advantages there. But the life insurance component, I'm this is what I'm thinking. This could yeah, also yeah. get started within that first 24 month period that I laid out with velocity banking are you in agreement or would you also have the you know peak the interest of the client to consider this yeah and maybe it getting funded with some of the savings this case study is perfect by the way denzel thank you for bringing me in on this this is awesome so let me say this about life insurance my wife and i are the same age relatively i'm a year older than her i own a tremendous amount of life insurance because you know when i die if i were to die prematurely i don't want my wife to go out and remarry and be happy I wanted to be miserable and rich. That's what the life insurance is for. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I own a lot, you what? know, for this woman here, um, I think she Absolutely. desperately needs to sit down with a, a team that specialized in retirement because there's a few things happening here. One, the elderly mom, we want to know what's going on with her finances. Is there things She's debt she free, completely okay. debt free. And is okay. only source of income is social security. Okay. That's helpful to know. So maybe there's not as much to work with there. But she definitely could use different types of life insurance to protect the different needs in her life. For example, I would encourage her to talk to her employer about how to max out the group term she has through the university. I think that's going to be one of the most cost effective ways to get protection for her daughter or for her estate to help with caring for her mom. So I think looking for like the best way to provide protection like pure protection, yeah. Um, that would be obviously a source you'd want to maximize, right? I mean, okay. if you said she might not be taking advantage of her full um, benefits through work, so that might be one place to start. But then, yeah, after that, then it might be really appropriate to say, how could I get the right you know, policies set up on brothers and myself to protect insurable interests um, to start to form some you know, protection in case one of those pre-retirement risks occur, which could be her passing away. Right. And to kind of close out here the sure. topic of the HECM mm-hmm. and the life insurance. In my mind, I was thinking, okay, I personally, I get to 62 years old and I have a property, I have a home and it's got all this equity and it completely paid off. And I was, say, rocking with my first lien HELOC for a while. And then yeah. I'm going to convert to a HECM. Let's say I do that, live my whole life, start drawing on that thing for years and years and years. Yeah. I pass away. I also mm-hmm. have a massive amount of life insurance on on myself at the moment and I'm assuming when I'm much older that death benefit would be way way higher. So yeah. my kids get the tax free death benefit payout. Mm-hmm. They now have the option to buy that property back if they want and they then want. Can, and then they can do it for themselves in terms of the heckum strategy cuz by the time I pass away, maybe my kids are around 50-ish and, and then getting close to that timeline where now maybe that house could be, they could do the same thing I did, yeah. right? Or yeah. not, or not, right? So they yeah, have- whatever they want to do. Okay, okay. Yeah, very cool. and you can buy with a Heckam. And that's where, that's why I pride myself in this team I've cultivated over the last decade because it's life-changing stuff. I mean, I have so many stories of people who, Ha, you know, had a dream of having a second home closer to their grandkids, and this heckum allowed them to do it because a mortgage broker came in and showed them how to structure things differently, right? And so, you know, I've heard a lot of stories like that. They're really meaningful, and that's what it goes back to, Denzel. Is like we may not, obviously, we're not going to be able to sit here in thirty minutes or whatever, an hour, and cultivate, you know, the best thing for this woman to do. But what my hope is is people are hearing the right principles to adopt when talking about retirement. Yeah. How do you think of things intentionally and how are you going to feel? What people underestimate is a couple of things. They underestimate their life expectancy, but they also underestimate what it's going to feel like to not have a job. And now after being a saver their entire life, start to pull money. Like right. people always think that start there's just like one day where things switches. That's not how it works. Mm-hmm. People get into this tug of war 
where they're not enjoying life because they're constantly living in scarcity going, I I can't take this. Like I only have this much, it's getting smaller and they're getting stressed. We, We gotta get proactive and help people to be encouraged. And that's the message of this video is there's all kinds of encouraging opportunities out there to help you to do what you want to do with your life because you've worked hard and you you should deserve to explore those. Absolutely. Listen, this has been awesome. I know we've definitely piqued the interest of my entire audience base here where are a lot of who is listening to this video are in that first 12, 24 months, 36 months of like debt elimination, maybe getting a policy in place. And awesome. they're a couple of years out from retirement. Yeah. And now you get to come in and touch on that guaranteed lifetime income process, that piece mm-hmm. there, how we maximize it, things to start doing, like go to ssa.gov and create an account. How many people haven't done that, you know, don't even know to yeah. do it. And then the right. whole the whole 401k, 403b, how do we secure that money if it is in high risk investments potentially for growth, how do we maybe transition either a portion or a majority of that money into a guaranteed lifetime income annuity plan to get that second guaranteed lifetime income? And then the third that really provides a nice boost of cash flow is a HECM. Once you're 62 or older, correct? You have to be a minimum of 62 years old, right? So yeah. that's that's huge because most people, especially coming from the Dave Ramsey community, especially my community and many other financial influencers that are pro being debt free. Yeah. Think of how many people do have their homes paid off, but still are living paycheck to paycheck and they're debt free and broke. There's a lot of people I've, I've worked with so many clients that have become debt free, but they're still yeah. like, I'm like, yeah. So you understand that yeah. becoming debt free is not financial freedom. Right. That, right. That's like not even close. Yeah. Was, yeah. All you did was remove your obligations to other institutions, but you still have the problem of cash flow. So Mind having a, cash flow. That's right. So having a about. half a million dollar home to just look and yeah. stare at a seven hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollar home, a million dollar home in California, two million dollar home, and you're just staring at it, paying the property taxes, and you don't know how to properly use that, reduce risk. So that Heckam could be a, a very, very unique strategy there. And then yeah. I think coupling that with a life insurance payout, a tax free yeah. death benefit payout that just removes all the burden altogether and allows the next generation to rinse, lather, repeat what you did and do it better because now they have more to work with. So this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I will have the links below for people to get a hold of you and also go to your social media and learn more about guaranteed lifetime income process, the um, social security annuity and just retirement planning as a whole. Yeah bringing velocity banking and retirement together, velocity banking, infinite banking and retirement, like all of them. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be all coming together. Yeah. And that's what I want to close with. If it's okay, Denzel, like, first of all, thank you so much for having me. There's so much more here for this woman. Like we didn't even talk about long-term care. There's there's so much more here for her that we could do for her. And I'd I'd be honored to meet her at some point, but yes, please feel free to reach out and uh, help in any way I can. But that's the message, right? Like I'm pro what's best for the individual. You know, Dave Ramsey's helped a ton of people. Then you can go to Velocity Banking and make an extremely accelerate what you're doing, help a ton of people. You could talk about this retirement process to help a ton of people. But what it comes down to at the end of the day is it's not so much about like this thing versus that thing. It's like, what are the principles that can help you to live the most fulfilling life? And it's all available to you. And so whatever we can do to help serve, that's why I wanted to reach out to you because you are the only one I've found that's bridging it all together in this perfect marriage to help bring the information to people. And it's, it's life-changing stuff, man. You're doing great. Thank you. Absolutely. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we'll be talking soon. Bye now.